All right, everyone, thank you to and welcome to the final session of the Amex Summit 2017, which in my humble opinion will no doubt be the best session, save the best for last and every other cliche that you can think of. And in the spirit of under-promising and over-delivering, this panel is going to give you insights in the trends around the world. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So for those of you who don't know, I am Jonna Burke. I am with Burrell's Loose, and I am joined by the very esteemed panel. We have Christoph from Kantar Media. Christoph, raise your hand so they know who you are. You can come on down because you're gonna be our first speaker. We have Anna from Lenovo. And we have Lassa Kaspar from InfoMedia, and we have Pierre from the Copenhagen Business School. So without any further ado, Christoph, if you'll please get us started. Uh, thank you very much, Joanna. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to start this uh, workshop. Sorry for my French accent, but the most important thing is that Jonah loves it. Um, so, I, I, would like to, sorry, I would like to start uh, with this slide. For people, uh, I am French, and for people like me who come from France, for people like you who come from the United States, England, uh, all over Europe, um, these uh, words seem incomprehensible, I mean impenetrable. Thai language is in impenetrable for us. But, you know, I like it, I like them, because it looks like poetry, it looks like um, elfic language in the world of Tolkien. Um, it looks like art, simply art. The first word means media, and the second one means communication. And if you want to join them with the simple word, uh, word and, media and communication, then you create another world. So it's totally different. We live in another, uh, not another planet, but another world. So language is really Heart, but it's complex. It's science. Language is science. And we find exactly the same complexity and the same challenge of science in the world of media and communication. Because everything evolves, um, we all know that everything evolves. Today, online, um, online and established media coexist enabling brands to uh, target consumers more precisely. But how do consumers feel about the increasingly sophisticated methods that brands are using to reach and influence them? First question. What are the key challenges uh, facing the industry today and in the future? These, are, these questions are the two pillars uh, of the survey made by Kantar Media, Dimension. We call it Dimension because we wanted uh, to take into account all dimensions of the communication. What is it about? In order to answer the two questions, Dimension explores many of the key communication, planning, buying, measurement issues faced by the industry. Dimension combines the views of more than 5,000 consumers from five countries and three continents, the United States, uh, Brazil, the United Kingdom, France, and finally, China. What they like, of course, what they dislike, what are their issues and concerns around media channels and advertising. First part of the survey. The second part, was reserved to industry leaders. We asked for 40 industry leaders' views on what we are doing well, what less well, and how the industry needs to improve. Several of them are on the top of the slide, so we have Google, uh, we asked Google, L'Oreal, PepsiCo, LinkedIn, etc. Then, on one hand, consumers, and on the other hand, 
industry leaders gave the two sides of the same coin, which made the specificity of this survey. The survey, of course, is heavy, is full of insights, full of ideas. Uh, you can download it freely uh, on our web website, kantar.com. Um, it is, I think it, is, it was translated in uh, several languages, except perhaps Thai language, sorry for this. So what is interesting uh, in our survey, for our industry first, sorry, is that everything evolves. We all know that lines are moving. What are we talking about? Uh, what do consumers call advertising? We ask the question, which of the following do you consider to be advertising? Of course, on the top, you can find ads, sponsorships. But, because there is always a but, messages from brands on social media, messages from brands in news and articles online, messages from brands in printed media forms are seen as advertising. So, the consumers uh, seems, you know, they, they have a lot of savvy, I mean. Uh, they don't make a difference between paid, owned, earned media, or even shared media. So, the boundaries are not so clear. Then, our first goal was to study the impact of advertising on consumers. One of the questions was, how often do you notice advertising from a similar brand across different channels? TV, social media, online, video magazines, etc. And this approach is identified by 85% of connected adults. They notice advertising across multiple channels. The conclusion is that uh, multimedia uh, strategies would appear to have a positive impact on consumer responsiveness and indeed is expected of major brands. Another question was, how often do you see ads that appear uh, to have been specifically shown or tailored to you? And consumers are aware of and even welcome specificity in targeting and relevance in content. 78% answered in that way. So, there is a clear and hardly surprising um, desire for relevance. The consumers like it, really. Two-thirds prefer ads that are relevant to them, and half would like to see relevant ads on browsing history. The second ID um, is of the survey is good news. I mean, the good news is that the consumers don't reject communication. Overall, attitudes towards communications remain positive. More than two-thirds uh, answer with positive or neutral reaction to communication. N and nearly three-quarter um, three answer that advertisers doing a better job than in the past. But, because there is always a but, digital show low tolerance. To what? Low tolerance with excessive repetition and unsophisticated retargeting. Then, it's not a question of like, it's not a question of dislike, it's a question of distribution, the quality of this distribution. It opens wide doors, from my point of view, uh, for brand content strategies operating by PR experts to build these content strategies. And the third lesson of the survey is about data, of course, the perfect data storm. It was the leader's part and leader's point of view. We ask these industry leaders, um, what are the main drivers of change? What are the major challenges and opportunities they face? And how, they, uh, how are they and their organization shaping up uh, to meet them? And the key word is still data. Philippa Browns uh, from OMG says, my focus is data, data, and data. What's different for 2017 is the focus on how we use that data to benefit our clients' businesses as well as ours. 
In our survey, uh, leaders were united in their views that the breadth and depth of the data now available is of a scale we haven't seen before. And when we speak about data, we think automation. It's not a bad thing, automation, but Many felt the industry, uh, many leaders felt the industry is in danger of becoming a slave to data rather than mastering it. There is too much, they say, that there is too much dependence to automation. Just because something is quantified doesn't necessarily mean that it is either accurate or objective. The phrase, not all data is equal, not all data is equal, was used by many leaders in the survey. So data shouldn't uh, lead to short-term measures, but long-term too. <coughs> many, uh, finally, many leaders felt the world of communication is simply too complex for any one organization, just one organization to manage every facet. There is a need, a need for multiple specialists, managed and coordinated towards a defined goal, certainly, but still specializing in their particular field. This is exactly what said Paul Fronton or Alberto Pecheguero from Globosat. If you, don't know, if you do not know what you want, it's no use having a lot of data. It will only complicate your decision. If you do not have good professionals to navigate the wealth of data you have, you will not have efficiency. And finally, some field data sharing partnerships will become more common between, uh, between of course, the major sets uh, of data owners, Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, Instagram, media owners, of course, and platform businesses and advertisers. This is what Simon Daglish uh, said from ITV said, I think the next year will be a pivotal year uh, for partnerships with clients to take hold. So working on data is good. Yes, it's good. We all do this. But it's better to work on shared data uh, for all the stakeholders. So I'm letting you with these three ideas, the idea of savvy consumers, positive attitudes uh, towards communication, and finally, how to embrace the perfect data storm with this idea of partnerships and shared data. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to ask one question of each of the presenters after their presentation, and then once everyone is finished, we'll open it up to everyone for questions. And so, Christoph, I found this very interesting because recently the USC Annenberg Global Communication Study indicated that within five years, the average consumer won't make a distinction between paid, earned, social, and owned media. And so you talk about that being fairly consistent. I think their numbers were 51% agree, 35% yep. disagree, and 14% neither agree nor disagree, but obviously that's the trend. So what is Kantar doing to kind of build that bridge? And, and also, do you think the peso model is already then outdated? I think that, uh, we, again, we all know that lines are, are moving. Yesterday, uh, Ellen from Philips said that Philips are also invest, investing in al analyzing paid content. We are exactly in the same situation, and EMEC, um, EMEC members said that new data sources included paid on earn is the second priority for future development. So. Uh, the idea is not to really break the silos between paid on earn, but just to build bridges. Uh, I think it's really important. I think it's really important to uh, keep uh, the identity of paid on earn. But uh, today we can find that bridges, uh, bridges are built. Uh, for Kantar Media, uh, in the Kantar Media situation, you know, we have f four activities, and we work separately. Uh, media data, uh, advertising data, consumer data, and audience data. And we decided not to build bridges, but to break these silos. It means that we create, since one year, uh, for one year now, sorry, uh, you know, one content media transformation. And so this is our goal in the next two years to create 
connection between all this data to uh, cells, to the, to the pain on, on uh, clients. Great, thank you so much, Christoph. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome Anna from Lenovo to the podium. Thank you. Um, um, first of all, I want to say how happy I am to be at AMEC. Um, summit. My last summit was in Barcelona, and since then I moved to Singapore. So this is why I'm, I think that this session brings you the best accents in the world. So we're moving to Russian from <laughs> French. Um, so I'm based in Singapore. Uh, I work uh, on the dark side now. I was always with measurement agencies before, and um, for the past uh, almost four years I work with Lenovo doing social insights uh, analytics and paid social now for global social media team. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today, it will be all social media, um, how we use uh, data that we get from our channels, from our partners, vendors, um, to do uh, measurement that will be actionable, that will inform all our stakeholders, and we have a lot, and will allow us to, to overall be smart uh, with what we are doing on social. So my team um, is, the most frequent questions we are getting from, from the teams in Lenovo is um, help us set KPIs for what we're doing on social, on digital, um, in our communications, um, help us choose um, the right metrics that you guys probably will be tracking for us, but we will put them into our KPIs. So we need to be confident that we're doing the right thing. So we developed uh, a very simple, um, a very simple criteria for how we pick the metrics out of hundreds that are available on social and digital. So we go through the list and we do it not once, but we do it regularly, um, and we assess each metric according to these three criteria. Here, so we make sure that this metric is valid, so it looks at the current behavior that we want to, uh, would, we want to have, um, and it looks at the relevant platforms. So, and this, this part is that is changing the most often because the way people consume content on social, the way people see brands, uh, what we've just seen that uh, people do not um, take messages on social as authentic, of course they see it as advertising, uh, but how they engage with this content on social is certainly different from how they engage with TV ads, for example. Um, also, we want these metrics to be scalable which means that uh, we are a big organization. Um, if a metric requires lots of resources to get, uh, we might not prioritize it. We still might consider it for one-off, uh, for some touch points and ad hoc basis, but um, if it requires manual collection, uh, human sentiment analysis of thousands and thousands of posts, um, so we would not probably have it as high priority metric and certainly not as KPI. So, um, and it has to be actionable. We have to be able to do something with this. If we are not able to change it, then we will not prioritize this. So, and then all our KPIs should be valid, scalable, and actionable. And I'll show you um, our recent set. It's better not to tweet, maybe. Uh, it's not that confidential, but I'm not quite sure. There's no Lenovo there, so it's okay. Um, so um, our main um, KPIs that we're looking at, um, and these are three uh, metrics that we take to C-suite. Of course, these are not the only metrics that we're looking at, but again, we very well understand the difference between when we have conversation with our execs and when we have conversation with our agencies, when we have conversations internally, with uh, marketing teams, uh, with uh, business groups, um, with people who lead campaigns. These are all very different reports, very different dashboards that we would produce. But one of very important tasks for us is to prove um, value of social um, to execs, which is the most common task that any corporate person would have. You have to prove your value, you have to um, uh, make sure you are getting your budgets, that um, you're able to do more and better next year. Um, so this year we are looking at share of voice, which is a very, uh, on social media, 
which is a very questionable metric in a way, in terms of how actionable it is. We did analysis on huge volumes of social media mentions, and of course, these are not conversations. This is spam, e-commerce, this are marketing messages, but it's hugely driven by media. So share of voice is not a social media metric. It's actually more PR and comms metric than social media marketing. And uh, from our team, we cannot really influence it, but it really means um, something for brand overall. So where we stand against our direct competitors um, and when this position changes, uh, it correlates with search volumes, it correlates, um, it, I'm not, I don't have data if it correlates with market share, I don't think so, but it does correlate with brand awareness. So we're looking at this as a um, high-level metric that helps us see where we are. We're looking at engagement with our content, and we're looking at engagement rates. So we want to understand um, how likely people are to engage with uh, our content if they see it. And uh, we produce this as a guideline. So the whole organization looks at this and adjusts their measurements according to this. We uh, provide them with technology and visualization platforms um, so that it's scalable and they know that they are able to get this data and we will support them there. Then, uh, as I said, these are not the only ones. <clears throat> oh yeah, there's another thing uh, that the valid part actually, which is uh, what I wanted to share. We used to have community size um, as a big KPI and uh, the number of followers that you are getting on social. And this is quite a standard metric still. So we dropped this because this metric has become irrelevant. So the platforms are uh, phasing out uh, follow account like Facebook. You would not see how many people like the page soon. Um, then, because there's no organic reach from community size, so this metric does not mean anything. Uh, it's not actionable, um, so we are not looking at this as a big KPI. Um, but then, if you look at this from the point of view of behavior, if you are liking brand's page, it does mean something. So we're considering this metric for our campaigns, because if we show ads and people go and like the page, it does mean um, it is a meaningful action, but a number of followers overall is, is not a meaningful number. So yeah, we produce uh, frameworks for campaigns. So this is something that would not necessarily go to execs, but um, we make sure that we align metrics with um, uh, objectives of each campaign. Some campaign may, might be purely brand awareness campaign, uh, because again, we are we are people who sit, who do stuff on very uh, high end of the funnel. So um, we take care of brand more than the actual um, sales. Uh, so for us, um, it could actually end there, and then we uh, help uh, markets generate um, consideration in intent and purchase uh, down the funnel. So we um, help with the guidelines to pick the metrics. Here, not all metrics might be scalable. So some uh, stuff they will need to plan uh, for the campaign, how they would, uh, for example, get the sentiment. That's where the sentiment uh, on social media is important. Um, and one more thing that we always do is we benchmark every number that we're getting for our overall tracking for uh, our campaigns. Benchmarking was, um, Surprisingly, not um, something that was used um, for every report. And we experimented a bit with the way we benchmark um, our performance. So this is an example that I wanted to share. These are two campaigns. Um, and this is the way we now uh, benchmark our campaigns, one against another. So we have different products. So for example, we have consumer products and we have consumer campaigns. We have commercial, smartphones. So with compare similar campaigns uh, one to the other. So the blue lines are uh, two years ago, uh, the orange are the last year campaign, and this is the content and engagement on pieces of content that we publish and promote. So you see that two years ago, our content engagement was more or less evenly distributed, and each um, piece of content is assigned a grade. So grade A is the best in class, 
grade B is uh, good and C, D, E is um, okay, not so good, and then never do this again. Um, so you see that how, mu how many poles we have in uh, grade E, and um, the next campaign has way more best performing content compared to the previous one, which means that um, this is the finding for us, uh, and we look both at the quality of content and the way we promote content as well, um, and change strategy. If, we, if this is what we want, we want to produce less, uh, but with better results. This is the way uh, for us to work smart. So we use this to inform the next campaign. I'm in the red zone, so <laughs> <laughs> I live. Go and finish. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, this, this is the technology that we use, so this is where you can take the <laughs> screenshots. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Anna. I think, you know, it's interesting because when you talk about your community size not being a KPI for you, do you still keep that as an index or in your analytics panel, even if you, you recognize it's not a KPI, but do you try to still keep that and then identify the correlations between that, or do you just drop it from the panel altogether when you've identified it's not a KPI? I'm glad my boss is not here. <laughs> this also um, should not be tweeted, apparently, so let's just put um, that on the record. Well, we track it uh, just because we have this data, but it really does not mean anything anymore. Uh, the biggest community comes from Facebook, and on Facebook, this is just a number. They do not, these people do not see what you publish. These people um, do not engage with you, mainly. Um, so all the data points, we, we did lots of audit on this, and we talked to partners. So no, we don't use it at all. Great. Thank you so much. I mean, I think that's an important distinction when we're talking about AVEs and you know throwing these metrics overboard because they, they don't have a value. I think to understand kind of what that index or what that panel is for your organization, and if you have a benchmark and if you have something to be able to identify, is there a correlation, is there not? But always kind of only reporting back to the executive team of what's really making a difference in your business is key, but being able to keep an eye on that. So thank you so much, Anna. And now, we're very excited, we have our final panel of the final session of the final summit, so everybody get excited. We have uh, Lassa, our award winner from last night for the Young Professional. Woo! We have, <laughs> we have Caspier and we have Pierre. And Pierre actually has a book out that he did with uh, some of his colleagues from ABC. So I think, you know, something interesting, I think he's going to talk a little bit about it or make a reference to it in the study that they did. But it's always exciting and I think important to support our members in all of their ventures and what they're doing. And it's a great book on uh, data and how big data can impact your business. So you guys, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation to uh, share our experience with this uh, research project at the Roskilde Festival. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the festival, but uh, it's ranked as the number four best festival in the world. It's among one of the largest festivals in Europe. There's uh, 140,000 people living uh, eight to 10 days. It's like a city. And uh, we have a lot of data. But I think it will be fair to do a small introduction to you about the festival. So we have a small video. Roskilde Festival has 130,000 inhabitants who travel here every year from around the world. The city is known for its magnificent architecture, the local cuisine, its devoted sports teams, and, of course, the impressive works of art from established and upcoming artists alike as the main attraction. People can hardly wait to move into this city, even if it's just for eight days every year. This is a city where the inhabitants don't necessarily speak the same language. Or any language, for that matter. And yet everyone always seems to make new friends. For some people, this is Dream City. For others, it's Street City. But really, this city is whatever you make it. 
Every year, everyone always takes home new memories. And they always seem to come back for more. Yeah, you might consider this as a, a rock festival. But it's, for me, it's not a rock festival. It's uh, more like a live lab, a city, where you have a lot of information from customers, from guests, participators. We have uh, a very central source for information, and that's the mobile app from the festival. Uh, 140,000 people are downloading the app. It's actually more than there are at the festival area. Uh, and we are able to track people where they are moving around uh, during the festival time. And we have 14 other data sources as well. Of course, we have a lot of sales data from the stalls. We also monitor all the social media uh, at the festival, during the festival time. It's around 70 million observations on Facebook alone. Uh, we also look at um, weather data and we have uh, sensor data from toilet. Casper will come into that later on. It's a very interesting case. Um, <laughs> and uh, of course, we also have a lot of media data. So we are really uh, well informed about what's going on. Uh, normally, people would look at data in a two-dimensional way. Uh, but you can't do that if, if you're going to use data in a proper way. You have to look at layers and look uh, through all these layers of data and then you will find some very interesting observations. So it's not always the right way to work uh, with starting with hypothesis because you can't always foresee what will, what will happen. And we have this uh, war room where we are 45 people in my team and uh, IBM is one of our partners and they are f uh, flying in uh, 10 global experts to help us. And we have a lot of senior academics, professors, PhD students, and of course, some students. So it's really a, a heavy setup. Uh, and how, what do we do? Um, so, at Coming Business School, we developed this model, uh, and um, this is the, the key model for how we are working with all the, the data. Uh, and I think I will uh, invite the gold winner for yesterday's evening to go through this because he's the right guy to do it. Thank you. So let's just go back one slide to, uh, to sort of go through. This is uh, the customer journey. Uh, it's called the infinity model. Uh, credits to uh, the CBS team. So it sort of says that part of this, the, the customer journey has to do with communication and the other part has to do with experience, both of, both of which lead back to, the, to, to what the, the, the client needs or the client, client objective is, which is, of course, people coming back each year or new people coming in. So the first step to make this more operational, this is a theoretical framework. Um, to make it more operational, we um, press this button. And then uh, we add the, uh, the business goals, which are you know, divided in two. Uh, the black ones are the more regular ones. Uh, you see those in more companies, of course, ticket sales, but also possibilities for selling more food, more drinks at the right times. So you have different stalls to know when people are actually going to, to, to be likely to eat uh, will make you able to sell more. So business opportunities. Uh, new revenue streams, completely new uh, patterns of movement makes uh, it possible to make new stalls. So other things and supply efficiency, of course, uh, not throwing out waste food because people didn't attend to the concert and this thus didn't buy uh, food from that stall next to the concert stage. So and this uh, in, in the bottom here, some of you, some of you might not see, it, but it's uh, the orange colored ones, are the NGO business goals, which is of course often uh, kind of corporate bullshit. Excuse me for my French. Um, but in this case, it's actually true because it's, it's a completely non-for-profit non uh, NGO. So when you, when you speak to those guys, they want to speak as much and they want to use as much time speaking about the orange goals as the black ones. Just so we're clear on that, the, this is uh, an NGO which uh, likes to, you know, 
uh, increase sustainability and make solutions. So that's also part of the, the, the reason we could make this project. So um, to make it even more operational, this is closer to a, an actual data model. We have uh, Frederick from uh, one, a guy from Infomedia. He said he's a tech guy. Says that's not a data model. You haven't seen the data model. <laughs> yes, I did. But uh, we want to make it uh, able to communicate it. So we put all the data points into the infinitum loop to sort of say that, that there's uh, contact points, which data points which, which have to do with communication, to, si to try and, uh, and see how can we communi communicate better. Um, and then a lot of data points. We'll get back to some of them, but that's way too many, but from various, various sources. Some, some from the app, some from the festival survey, some from external, uh, like a Danish Technology University a lot of different suppliers, and we're still adding new data all the time. But, but these, on this side, the touch points has to do with experience. So on the one hand, we have sales modeling, which is about you know, statistical modeling on how to improve your communication as to sell more or um, in increase engagement with the, with the purpose of increasing you know, indirect sales. And on the other hand, service models, service modeling, how to improve the actual experience from the assumption that the better the experience, the more likely they will return. But on, on the right hand side, it's also about communication because if something within experience changes, then you would want to communicate it as well. And that's why the live city lab is, is very important. Okay, we know more people are going to attend. We have to communicate go this, this way around, or maybe some areas are flooded, don't go there, whatever. So it's, this is also relevant for communication. So this is the infinity loop. We try to make it as uh, easy, easily digestible as possible. And then Casper uh, will provide you with a, f with a few examples. <clears throat> yeah, we are three shy guys, so we have to share the presentation. Um, are you ready to rock out some of the results? Yeah, rock out. Uh, did you get that? Um, <laughs> of course, with all the data we have, we could have been, been talking for the entire AMEX summit on all the data and all the examples, but we chose three that we think are, are interesting in, in, uh, for you. And uh, one is within the era of sales modeling. And yes, that is just a cigarette. Um, Basically, what we, through data, can see now is there is a 19% correlation of ticket sales to earned media, uh, or PR, um, which is a lot higher than they expected, and it's for sure a lot higher than as to where you see they, you, they use their marketing and PR spend. Um, what we're going to do next is, of course, get more data and see if, if this is, if this is true, these are numbers for last year. Like we said, it's a four-year project. But what's interesting here is that we are actually we are talking about this in the industry for, for a lot of times, that earned media has a higher effect, marginal effect, than paid media. What's interesting with this, and also with the university on board, is that we're actually proving it now, that you should do a shift in the way you communicate to your, uh, to your buyers of, of tickets for the festival because you get much more out of doing PR than, than doing paid. And that, that's kind of interesting, but it's because it fundamentally changes the way they should think about their communication. Um, so that's, that's huge. They can save tons of money on paid, convert it to PR, change the way they communicate about. I mean, what they usually do is, is probably do a, the Big Bang program release. What they should do instead is just announce one, uh, act at the time for perhaps six months and that will increase ticket sales much better than, th than just doing a big release and, and paying for it. So fundamentally changing the way the festival thinks about communication in terms of, of earned and, and paid media. Another e example is, uh, is more on the experience side. <coughs> Sorry. And that has to do with, uh, with predictive modeling and predictive data. Because we have the app, we are, this is going to sound awful, but we, we can, we, we, once you've got, got an app on a phone, you can tap into a lot of stuff on that one. So basically, uh, we use it during the festival to know where people are, where they're going. We can 
do crowd control, but for example, we also get access to some of their Spotify data. So, uh, so we have an idea about the 140,000 people attending the, uh, the concerts, uh, what are their musical music interests. So, so basically in 2016, Alex Vargas was playing, and we could predict that they should not put him on a stage which was uh, suited for 5,000 spectators. By 90%, we can, we can um, predict how many people will show up at a, con at a concert, and we predicted 20,000 people. So he was at a wrong stage in terms of, of where he should be. And of course, um, the Roskilde Festival, they, they kind of didn't listen to data, so they put him on the, on the stage for 5,000 people, and it actually ended up, of course, being chaos. So by not listening to data, by not reacting to what data shows you, they ended up giving 15,000 people a, a worse experience that they could have, and it almost became a bit dangerous with, with a too small stage and, and four, four times as many people that they're supposed to be there. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting, and we're going to do the same predictions this year. Where should you move your axe in terms of how many people are, are going to show up? In the worst case, they will show up with beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, new festival for me then. Um, The last one we have is, uh, and, and this might sound into or sound funny, why are we pulling data on, it's a bit, you can't see it, but it actually says up here how many kilos are in each toilet. Um, and, and why are we pulling that data? First of all, uh, we can, and we want to pull as much data in as we can. But secondly, um, this is a big issue at a festival because I don't know if you've been to one, but when these guys are full, you drive in a big truck and they, it sucks for a long time. And the entire tent area, which you saw in the movie, it kind of smells. So, um, so what we can do here is rather than sending a big truck to empty, for example, 50 toilets, we can send a smaller truck and just empty the two toilets which we know are full. So this also increases the experience it enormously for the people sitting in the tent camps because he can be in and out of there in perhaps two minutes rather than emptying 18 or 48 toilets which are actually already empty. So, uh, I mean, this, is, this might sound trivial, but uh, in, in the overall goal for, for Roskilde, which is to, to build a community, I mean, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to live in a city that doesn't smell like shit uh, <laughs> a lot of the times, and this will just increase the overall uh, experience. Um, one funny thing here is that that even though we have the data and it's evident that they could, uh, this is of course both an experience thing, but also a cost-saving thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can save money by having smaller trucks, uh, fewer empty the toilets a few, fewer times, everything. So there's so many benefits in in this. But even though the, the data shows that they're doing some wrong shit, um, they, they, didn't, they didn't change the way they work. I mean, you probably had this guy on the, on the truck driving for the last five years, and they, they, they're used to working like this. So even though that we can support with data how you should trans, transform the way you do your, your services, uh, they didn't change it yet, so it's going to be interesting to see if, if it, they're actually going to pick up on that in the future. Uh, those were the three examples. Uh, if we try to put this in a AMIC perspective, uh, I think this is an extremely interesting pro project because, like it says on the, on the said on the first slide, we are basically doing impact first. We are we are we are pulling data from all kind of behavioral touch points and then moving backwards towards in the framework rather than starting out by planning what's going on with the activities and then measuring the impact. We are pulling data on all behavioral factors and, we, uh, and then we're kind of yeah, working our back backwards to figure out where do you need to optimize. So the AMIC framework is just perfect for us. We just we start, we're starting in the impact end, and we we can of course only do that because we have a 
a client and a, and a team that's allowed to have all this data from the uh, from the uh, from the festival. Um, one one cool thing as well is we started out by saying, okay, this should be the sales modeling. We want to sell more tickets. We want to sell them faster. Um, so so we kind of looked into how how does communication change behavior in terms of ticket sales. But we uh, during the festival we then like as I said we can look at behavior and uh, and then change the way we com communicate to people. Um, for example, this picture. I think there's 100,000 100, people at a concert. If it starts raining, it's pretty useful that we can predict how, where 20,000 people are going. Because if they all go in the same direction, we should have more security people over here and less, less over here instead of just like scattering all over the place like we're used to. So um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of data, a lot of insights. Um, I think we had it, had it the conclusions already that uh, that culture eats yeah, data, for example, and it's it's the case here as well. Even though we are, we hope, some pretty sassy companies and guys within the project, it's difficult to to change the mindset of the customer to uh, to react on what data says. So even though that that we in a project with which for a for Infomedia and CBS just gives us tons of insights and really cool recommendations. We still have a client who's reluctant to, uh, to change their way, so they have a strong culture. So I think that's, that's kind of interesting to have to moving forward, that even though we are changing our ways, uh, we, see, we see a lot of times that we want to push a new agenda uh, for our customers, but we, uh, we need to make sure they're ready for it as well. So yeah. This is how it started, and now it's a now it's a city. It was actually just born on on the uh, on the fall of Woodstock, so it's it's been 45 years in the making, and uh, yeah, like we say, one of the biggest festivals. And if you uh, if you if you're in Copenhagen in the first week of July, give us a call and uh, we'll make sure we're not out out of beer in the war room and you'll be able to come and see some of all the, the live data that we are able to uh, to produce during the festival. Thank you. Great. Thank you guys so much. I think that's such an amazing example of a data rich culture, but then there's still that element of the humans who don't always specifically follow the data. So there's probably some instinctual difference that they have, which I think goes into the need of everyone who's involved in communications to have a greater insight into neuroscience too, so that you know we can always use the data as a guide and the more enriched we are, but to then understand what the human interaction, what that human decision making, what those factors are as well, so that you can really maximize and, and drive that data. But so I think for so many people here, this is a case study of the ideal, right? Everyone wishes that their organization could have access to this much data, that it could be so specific, that you could have a proven history and track record of how actionable it is. So for you guys, I guess my question is, what's next? Well, I, I think uh, at least one, one more year in the project. <laughs> but but uh, what's interesting here is that, that this is kind of like a closed circuit environment which we are uh, which we are fortunate to be a part of, and I think it's it's both because it's an NGO, we got the uh, the Copenhagen Business School involved, and and uh, so it's it's kind of an experiment. But what it does is give us the opportunity to take all the findings, all the understanding on how we work with data, new technology, pull that out and apply that for our normal uh, measurement business uh, analytics, and and then build new models on that. So uh, so. What's next for for us is is kind of taking this and, and, and applying it to other festivals or even B two B companies, and all because I mean we learn a lot from this. I think so. making sure that the companies don't want to smell like crap too can probably be helpful <laughs> yeah. as a. All companies have toilet issues at some <laughs> point. So uh, yeah, basically, no, what we well, from a more technical point of view, what we want to add more data and we want to add more uh, analytical power. To, uh, especially from my point of view and from, from an AMIC point of view, it's going to be very interesting, this, um, this sales modeling thing with all the communicative uh, touch points. 
I think we would, we would also like to involve drones uh, in the project uh, because uh, there's a, a huge uh, uh, service discussion about traffic uh, and how to guide the traffic and drones could be very helpful in that. Uh, and I think we have another um, vision we would like to do and that's try to uh, you know, all the, the, the journalists, they are writing about the bands. Uh, and sometimes it's not the same uh, observation as the, the audience has. So we would like to compare the, uh, the, the articles from the journalists with, with the social data uh, uh, post and see if there's some gaps. Great, great. And I think we'll open up the questions to the audience now. And if you'll take the mic over there. But before we take your first question, which I know is going to be amazing, I think one of the things that always impresses me about AMEC is we have all of these international case studies, all of these international presenters, and you know, for the most part, they're all presenting in a language that is not their native language for very complex, very detailed information. So if everyone will please join me in thanking, I think, especially these speakers, but the speakers throughout the conference in really delivering great content in a difficult situation. So you guys, thank you so much. Our first question. Yeah, thank you very much, but we don't have an accent. <laughs> so, I, have, I have two questions, one keeping with the toilet theme. What is a urine dust sensor? <laughs> uh, but secondly, always more data is great because then you can figure out more. But do you run into, com like, do you run into compliance issues because, you know, is the data you're collecting all for a business purpose? And the financial services, and, you know, so like the Spotify data. You can do a lot of cool stuff with that, but is that why somebody's downloading the app? Do they know that, et cetera? Uh, I think we, we have to uh, say that we have very strange uh, relation about ethics and morals and how we are working with data. And, and we don't use any personalized data at all. We, we take that away and we have some uh, security functions so that it will go through uh, three layers. Uh, and. Um, on the other hand, as a university, we have some uh, other opportunities, thank God, uh, and therefore we are able to work with data in a different way, but it's still in a, a very closed and secure environment. And I'd, I'd like to answer the urine dust sensor thing. Um, back maybe f 15 years ago, when I, when I was even younger, um, <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've attended to this festival 13 times or something, uh, and I was interviewed um, why am I going for a, for a major uh, newspaper in Denmark? And I was going on and on how great it is. The only slight problem is when the weather is too good, people start stamping. And in Denmark, we have a, a, yeah, some call it a despicable culture of the men peeing in the in the woods, like the, the closing to close to the dust path. <laughs> and when it's good weather, the, the, the dust sort of gets into the air and it's urine dust. So what I was complaining about, you know, when it's too good, the, the festival is that good. So the only major issue is sometimes you get black uh, boogers <laughs> and of course that was the headline the worst is, is the black boogers and the picture of me <laughs> that was my first time in a national newspaper <laughs> but the sensors they sense w w are there dust clouds coming and are there, you know if, if there's a, a, lot, a lot of concentration of urine dust then it, we should change communication as you know go this way around go, go yeah. choose another path please yeah, or, or, or we, we could also be a little bit ahead because we, we know the weather forecast and we can see how the weather will develop and then we can put some water on and then we can, you know, damage control it. So maybe Amex would like to be the sponsor of the medical mask if there is a high probability of urine dust during the next conference. Just a little option and marketing promotion opportunity for you that wouldn't breach any of the financial obligations. The next question, who would like to be next? But, but please notice, Danes <laughs> are not a nation of people peeing in the woods. <laughs> yeah, you just have a term, urine dust, uh, coincidentally. <laughs> Great. I guess, um, Christoph, I'll start with you. When you look at the Kantar research, and then we have, there's a lot of other research, are you all doing anything you know, in looking at models like what InfoMedia has to be able to apply that data and kind of merge that data into the kind of infinite customer experience model? I mean, are you guys already doing that? Do you have an example of how that might be working with some of the data that you're collecting? Yeah. 
sorry. Uh, yes, because uh, we work with consumer and shopper data a lot, but uh, this is a really good example of the idea of building bridges and break the silos between the, um, between the activities. Um, we all know that social media represent a part of ideas of the consumers, um, but it's not regular. In the other hand, we have shopper data and consumer data uh, from panelists. I would say thousand. In France, we have more than uh, 15, 15 uh, panelists who answers uh, who answer a lot of questions, thousands of questions, and this data is regular because you don't change your behavior. Uh, in one day. So we compare the two types of data uh, from one hand social data and on the other hand consumer data. So we build these bridges to answer uh, uh, the behavior and to give insight of the behaviors of the consumers. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Excellent, I will take it then. I'd like to thank everyone for that opportunity. Noted, <clears throat> front row. Um, <laughs> and I guess I wanna open this up to everyone on the panel. And you know, we, we kind of talked to the Infimedia group about kind of what's next, but I guess if we take a break from, you know, navel gazing and kind of take a look at that future aspect of where we see measurement and evaluation, what would your ideal utopia be for what you would like to see and what you would like to see us talking about next year in these similar sessions as it relates to the data and kind of what your organizations are doing now? I, I would like to see first uh, more example of what I make members want. I mean, uh, to see uh, how do we break the silos in reality with our clients. Uh, because again the lines are moving we are speaking about the age of change uh, so what's next what are the built the, the bridges what are the bridges and between which activities so to to see more move uh, on the loop great Anna um, I think and I hope that we'll be talking uh, in addition to the uh, measurement frameworks we'll be talking about attribution because the last part, the impact, there's a huge jump from everything else that is clear and then impact is very questionable usually. So the more studies we have on attribution and you guys show this direct sales attribution from PR, that's great. The more numbers we have like that will be uh, very useful to everyone. Thank you. Uh, I hope that, the, that people will use this opportunity for communication to, you know, take a hand on the digitalization because I think if we, if we keep communicating with you know old school reports only editorial media communication will be disrupted and not disruptive but I think digitalization the tools out, out there the, the amount of data and uh, not least the speed with which you can make recommendations we need to grasp it uh, so that's what I, that I hope that's what I hope people take from this course and I would love, love is if we as an industry started having a, 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 a broader outlook, because I think when we, when we meet here, we basically just have discussions within, within our, our area. And what, what we found out by opening, I mean, we are not as a session, we are, we are not a Kantar, we are a regional player in the Nordics. And, and we, are, we won't be able to do like Samsung worldwide, but but what we can do is, is be more open to partnerships, partnering with the, uh, with the universities, uh, getting involved with, uh, with technology that we perhaps didn't think of before. So, so I, I would love if we as an industry kind of got involved in more high-tech uh, discussions, understanding uh, not, not even data, but also technology, and then where can we partner in order to to set us apart from everybody else, from from agencies and stuff like that. Yeah. So broader perspectives, mindset. Perfect. And that's the, And I, I want to say one <laughs> final thing. If you have one takeaway, and this is important, you can get great insights 
from Shitty Data. <laughs> Well done. So I want to thank everyone. And I think, you know, the whole theme of this conference has been disruption. And even during this theme, we've heard a lot of people talking about the new normal. And I think as soon as we start talking about the new normal, there's that next wave of disruption. And I would encourage all of you who are obviously wanting to be thought leaders and thinking ahead of the curve for your organizations and for the industry overall to make sure that you keep the attitude of always in beta and always testing and always exploring how data can be used and, and penetrate and be more influential in your organization. With that, I would like to conclude the final session for us of AMEC 2017 and hope to see all of you next year. So thank you all very much.